good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Olga Stanoilovich, and I'm chair of the Serbian Council of Great Britain. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, which the Serbian Council is co-hosting uh, with the Sensava Serbian Orthodox Church. And thank you for allowing us to use the practice. Uh, tonight's event is part of Serbia Month in Great Britain, which is now in its 16th year, and it's recognised as one of the most significant festivals of Serbian arts and culture in the Serbian diaspora. And this is one of 40 events that's taking place during the month, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at some of the other events. Um, can I also draw your attention to the Serbia Month catalogue? Uh, which accompanies the festival. The theme of this year's catalogue is uh, Serbian culture, with a particular focus on music and folklore, as well as information about the Serbian community in Britain, its community organisations, and the co contribution that we make to uh, British society. And you can view the catalogue online or you can buy a copy, it's £15, and we're using the money to help fund other Serbia Month activities. But back to tonight's event, and I'm delighted to introduce Colonel Nikilic, who's going to talk and show us the exhibition he curated about the role of the British in Yugoslavia in World War II, whilst he was defence attaché at the British Embassy in Belgrade. Uh, despite COVID-19, uh, the photographic exhibition opened at the British Embassy in Belgrade in September 2020 with support from the Serbian Ministry of Defence. And the exhibition tells the story of British involvement in Yugoslavia in World War II from both sides using a large number of previously unpicked unpublished images, reports and oral history accounts held in the Imperial War Museum, the National Archives, as well as the Serbian Military Archives. It brings this fascinating period of history to life and is a history that is of particular interest to British Serbs. And I'm only sorry that um, Many of the people whose lives it impacted on directly, like my father, didn't live to see this exhibition. Uh, I think the importance of the exhibition is shown by the fact that instead of only running for two weeks in Serbia, the exhibition toured 11 cities in Serbia for 12 months. Mick's now back in the UK, and during last year's Serbia month, he gave a talk on Zoom about the exhibition, and it was so well received and attended that this encouraged us to go for one better this year, and to uh, have a live event with the exhibition and Nick talking to us about it, as he did with an unexpected visitor in Belgrade, President Vucic. So if it's good enough for him, I think it's good enough for us. So, welcome to the exhibition and the talk which British said should be seen and heard by every British Serb. So, over to you, Nick. Thanks, Olga. Uh, and also, thank you very much to uh, Marco and also to Alex, uh, not only for hosting the exhibition here, uh, co hosting and serving them, but also looking after it in his garage uh, once uh, it, uh, for the time before you know, it, it was put up. Um, so, what I'm going to do is literally um, talk you through the exhibition. So if, if those of you who are here could just move into the centre. Uh, if people need to sit down, then the chairs are out there, but ultimately uh, it's going to be a sort of moving and a story. And can I just thank you, for everyone for the Absolutely. If I, if I can start by saying um, the, the reason why I was prompted to um, produces that exhibition was really on the success of what we did in Serbia during the uh, 100th anniversary of the Great War of 1914 and 1918. 
where ultimately the story of British medical support to the Serbs really still to this day captures people's imagination. And in fact, Olga and Gordon and I uh, accompanied a group of um, you know, 11 Scottish ladies uh, back to Serbia in, in September. And we did a fantastic tour of all the locations associated with Scottish women's hospitals. And that kind of inspired me to think, well, actually, that's the Great War. What about the Second World War? The only problem is, of course, is that the Great War isn't controversial. The Second World War is hugely controversial, and to this day, still divides communities, families, historians, because of the conflicting narratives, because of what happened in Yugoslavia during the Second World War. And I think if one looks at the Second World War, no other front that was fought during the Second World War is as controversial as the events in Yugoslavia themselves. And for me, bringing what happened then into the present, that was probably one of the first information wars that actually was fought. Not only was it a, a fight against an occupation, it was a civil war, but it was also an information war. And we see that very much today in terms of how the battle for the narrative sometimes is more important than the actual fight on the ground themselves. And therefore what we have is a, diverted, uh, a divided narrative where effectively all sides look at things purely from their perspective and therefore aren't really willing to accept the other side of the story or at the same time the problem is, is that victory is always written by the victors and therefore ultimately what we find is it, the story is cemented by those who won. What's really interesting about the British involvement in Yugoslavia, and we, and we tend to forget this, is that British officers served on both sides of the divide, both, first of all, with Mikhailovich's Chetniks, formerly known as, as, formerly known as the Yugoslav Army of the Homeland, and also the Partisans, the National Liberation Army of Yugoslavia. And really, after the Second World War, it was only really the story of the Partisans that was really common knowledge. And when I started to research this expedition, ex exhibition, I then uncovered vast amounts of material, both in the Imperial War Museum and the National Archives, and particularly photographs that have never previously been published. Because, of course, it goes against the received wisdom of the narrative of the Second World War in that respect. And ultimately, what happened in Yugoslavia during the Second World War did change the course of history. Because, of course, it was the fact that you know, Hitler, because of what happened in March of 1941 with the Belgrade coup, had to divert his forces instead of attacking the Soviet Union to basically uh, you know, prevent uh, Yugoslavia becoming a Western satellite in that respect. It delayed his invasion of the Soviet Union by six weeks and the German army weren't able to get to Moscow that winter. That lost Hitler the war. Hitler also claims that because of the efforts of particularly the Serbs in Serbia and throughout Yugoslavia, that's why Rommel lost the war in North Africa, because it was also a battle for supplies. But of course, from a Western perspective, particularly a British perspective, we tend to focus on the fronts where we fall, very much Normandy or North Africa or, or Italy. We don't really talk about what happened in Yugoslavia. And particularly for those officers who operate in the high military forces, uh, predominantly in Serbia, theirs really is a forgotten story. And this exhibition kind of brings to life both sides of that story in that regard. So really, in terms of where the story begins, Yugoslavia was absolutely vital to Nazi Germany's war machine. Because, of course, whilst Yugoslavia was neutral, it could use Yugoslavia's resources in order to basically buy the materials to basically support its military. So, for example, only Yugoslavia and Norway produced the vital elements required by Nazi Germany to make armoured plate. Vast amounts of copper, lead, aluminium were also sourced from Yugoslavia. Therefore, it was absolutely vital for Germany to keep Yugoslavia out of the Western uh, sphere of influence and very much in its own in that respect. But of course, from a British perspective, you know, after the fall of France, you know, from Churchill's perspective, it was all about the defeat of Nazi Germany. And after the fall of France, he gave orders uh, to the Ministry of Economic Warfare to form an organisation known as the Special Operations Executive, designed to set Europe ablaze, to send individuals around all the occupied territories to basically organise the resistance and carry out sabotage in order to take the fight into the centre of what was known as Fortress Europe from Hitler's perspective as well. So even before uh, the March coup of 1941, even before the, uh, the German invasion of the 6th of April 1941, 
British officers were already operating across Yugoslavia in order to basically encourage anti-German uh, elements within the government, within opposition parties, in order to basically keep them on the side of the British themselves. And if necessary, to organize a coup against any government that basically took Yugoslavia into the side of, of, of the Axis, i.e. signing of the Tripartite Pact. The problem, of course, is that Yugoslavia was the last country in the region to basically become a member of that pact, and Prince Paul and his government were really forced to sign it eventually in Vienna on the 25th of March of 1941. And it was a signing of that pact that really brought demonstrations into the streets, primarily in Serbia, but in other parts of Yugoslavia. And when the military then saw that they had the support of the people, that's when they then carried out the coup on the 27th of March. And lo and behold, uh, the, the government basically fell and Prince Paul uh, was therefore exiled in that respect. The report written by um, Colonel Gubbins, who basically commanded the whole Special Operations Executive um, effort, the day after the report basically claimed that it was SOE who effectively organised the coup. In reality, it was the Serbian people who organised the coup. It was just that the British tried to claim the coup for themselves uh, in, in order to sort of you know, justify their, their particular existence. In reality, uh, the coup itself came off to a bad start because no sooner had they realised that they'd taken power, nothing really changed. And they were still going to honour the government, but not the new government similarly honour the original clauses of the tripartite pact. But Hitler was so enraged by the action, particularly of the Serbs, that he organised Operation Punishment, which was the destruction, therefore, of Yugoslavia itself. So really, from a, from a British perspective, £100,000 was spent in order to prepare for the coup and prepare for an invasion. Things like wagon loads of ammunition were held on the Greek side of the Yugoslav border, ready to support any resistance organisation that was basically formed following any invasion themselves. But none of these plans came to anything in that respect. As I said, some of the officers on the ground themselves, you can see pictures in, in, in the pictures there. Uh, the individual at the top, uh, it's quite a fascinating story, because when he arrived in Belgrade, uh, just before the, uh, the coup um, you know, actually started, he arrived at the Belgrade train station. Within the embassy, or the legation as it was known in Belgrade, there was already tension between the security services in terms of MI6, as we know them, the James Bonds of the world, and the Special Operations Executive. Already tensions were there, because of course, the spies want to do things covertly. These individuals wanted to be very much overt in, in terms of their actions. So when he arrived in Belgrade at the train station, a car from the embassy was waiting for him, took his attaché case with, with, with the sensitive documents uh, with him, and then left him to his own devices. He then called a taxi to the Majestic Hotel, which is still very much in Belgrade. Uh, if you know, it's a very smart hotel. Uh, and when he got into the, the lobby and asked for a room, the, the reporter was obviously shaken and slightly concerned. And the story is that this hotel had been designated by the Yugoslav government as a hotel for German visitors. The three crowns was for the British visitors. And lo and behold, he took the wrong choice, went to Majestic, and the next morning at breakfast he realised that the hotel was for the Germans. So even before the invasion of Yugoslavia, you know, Belgrade was full of Germans. It was also full of British and the like, all trying to persuade the Yugoslav government to do their bidding in that respect. And again, another interesting uh, character, Alexander Glenn, a great Scottish explorer, uh, wrote a fantastic book about his exploits uh, in, in Serbia at that time. He was the naval attaché, in inverted commas. He was actually a member of the Shoprizations Executive. And he then later served with Tito's partisans in Yugoslavia. And it's a fantastic book in that respect. Of course, as we all know, Germany invaded. You know, the, Yug the Yugoslav army was not the Serbian army of the Great War, and then very, very quickly capitulated. And, and, and the fragmentation of that army really was the source of all the problems in terms it wasn't able to defend against the Nazi Germany at the height of its power in that respect. And therefore, you know, the army capitulated, and, and lo and behold, the speed of the capitulation shocked the British. When the coup took place, Churchill very famously said, you know, Yugoslavia has found its soul. But he anticipated that the Yugoslavs would resist, that of course the resistance wasn't there in terms of the way in which the invasion uh, was, was defended. And so lo and behold, you know, he was quite shocked. And of course there's much criticism about the king leaving, but of course, you know, 
politics and, and, and state building and nationalism, it's like a game of chess. It's all about protecting the king. And of course, all the European monarchs left their countries in order to basically you know, find uh, you know, sanctuary, particularly in, in Britain in that regard. As we know, the government left, uh, left Belgrade. The last time it met together was on the 13th of April in Parle, just outside Sarajevo, then went to Nixlish, and from Nixlish went to Athens, from Athens to Jerusalem, and eventually uh, the king then arrived in London itself in, in that regard. But then there was no contact whatsoever with any of the movements that the British had been dealing with early, prior to the war itself effectively start, starting, until around June of 1941, where in Portishead in Bristol, a signal was received from what people believed to be the Yugoslav resistance, because the message was the Yugoslav army is still fighting, send supplies. And, and that, that, that information was believed to have come from a certain individual known as uh, Colonel Dragulio Draja Mikhailovich. So lo and behold, Julian Emery, who had been operating in the Belgrade embassy, now operating outside Istanbul, his father was the minister for India in charge of government. And through his father's influence, he managed to get a submarine, HMS Triumph, in order to basically send Bill Hudson, who'd also been a member of the secret intelligence services, as well as the SOE operating in, in, in Serbia prior to the war. He was a mining engineer uh, working out, out of uh, the Prepture mines. And he therefore uh, uh, arrived aboard HMS Triumph, a British submarine, on the 20th of September, uh, just off the uh, Adriatic coast in Montenegro in Petrovac on the sea in that regard. He was met by a local shepherd, taken to uh, some local resistance fighters, and to his surprise, he found out they weren't royalists. They, in fact, they were partisans. And in fact, one of those was Milo Gilias, who we all know from our Yugoslav history in that respect. He was then taken by Gilias and Korta Popovic uh, through Montenegro uh, to Foča in Bosnia, where he met Tito. Tito was very suspicious of what the British were doing, of course, from Tito's perspective, and he started uh, his movement's resistance against the Axis occupation after the invasion of the Soviet Union, whereas Mikhailovich started his resistance on the 13th of May, shortly after the invasion itself. And of course, from Tito's perspective, you know, he, he knew that the British wanted to maintain their influence in Yugoslavia, where he was very much focused towards the East and Soviet Russia in that regard. So he's very suspicious of um, uh, um, Hudson, particularly Hudson's mission was to go to Ravna Gora in order to meet Mikhailovich himself. And he tried to prevent him to go there. But at the end of the day, he went to Mikhailovich. He then organized an airdrop uh, shortly after for Mikhailovich and suddenly then realized the problem that was still existing in Yugoslavia and that was that division, because of course, the two sides, both the communists and the royalists, were more interested in fighting themselves than they were the Germans. Because well, initially, whilst they did co uh, collaborate together and particularly created the first free territory in the whole of, uh, the whole of Europe, very famously known as the Uzhuska Republic, eventually in terms of the part of that history, at the end of the day, it was the fact that Mikhailovich wanted to keep the status quo, a royalist government dominated effectively by Serbs, Tito wanted to create a social revolution and therefore take power that the two sides physically couldn't go on. And therefore, Hudson stopped any further supplies going to Mikhailovich, which really sort of, you know, upset Mikhailovich and the two massively fell out. And of course, that falling out found Hudson in Užica on the 29th of November of 1941, when the town fell to the Germans and the partisans were scattered, and as were the Mikhailovich's checkmates in that regard. And Hudson then went missing for the next few months, living off the land, very much being helped by local civilians, sheltered by them, uh, whilst the British had no idea where he was or what was going on in that regard. So in the end, in February of 1942, another mission uh, in terms of, um, by a chap called um, Terence Atherton, again a member of Special Operations Executive, who before the war was operating in Belgrade as a journalist, and some of you might have heard of the Britannova a newspaper, a very pro-British newspaper. He was the editor of that. He was then sent in exactly the same route as Hudson was, landed by submarine off the coast of Montenegro, uh, went into, into uh, Bosnia, met up again with Tito, but shortly after leaving Tito's headquarters, disappeared and was never seen again. He was murdered. What he was murdered for is, again, a matter of controversy. Ultimately, all these British officers carried gold sovereigns with them in order to pay for their way. 
Everybody knew that, and the chances were he was basically murdered by, by thieves or elements, be they communists or royalists, who were after affecting the money themselves. So lo and behold, the second mission effectively failed. But just after Atherton had been killed, lo and behold, Hudson then reappears and finds his way back into Mikhailovich's camp and then begins a tour with Mikhailovich of the situation on the ground. And of course, 1942 was absolutely critical for the British war effort against Germany because the war in Africa was really now hotting up. And therefore, Germany needed to keep those supply lines through Serbia in terms of the railways to allow basically Rommel's forces to be, basically, to be uh, supplied. And of course, this is where the resistance on both sides uh, played a major role. And this is why Hitler said the reason why uh, Rommel uh, lost the war in North Africa was because of the Raj Mikhailovich, because so much of the rolling stock required by the Germans was either put out of action or destroyed. The problem was German repl reprisals. Because for every German killed, it would be 100 Serbs who would be executed. For every uh, German wounded, 50 Serbs would be executed. Not Bosnian Muslims or Croats or Slovenes, it was Serbs. And therefore, the two organisations saw themselves very, very different. In fact, many years ago, in the early 1990s, there was a documentary on BBC Time Watch called The Sword and the Shield. I don't know if people have seen that one. And that sort of beautifully describes, I suppose, the two different attitudes of those resistance leaders. Mikhailovich saw himself as a shield to protect particularly the Serbian but also Yugoslav people, whereas Tito saw himself you know, as carrying the sword to take the fight to the enemy. The problem was that neither resistance organisation could actually take the fight to the enemy because they simply couldn't match German might in that respect. So for both sides, it was very much self-defence in, in, in that regard. And for Mikhailovich in particular, he was very much about passive resistance. This wasn't about destroying troop trains in order to kill as many Germans as possible because of the reprisals. And we know that the Germans would simply round up entire towns, villages, or areas in Belgrade and keep them in concentration camps ready to execute them because of the actions of resistance organizations. For him, it was about sabotage, it was about uh, blowing up bridges, it was about destroying uh, the rail railway lines in order to delay those supplies getting to Germany. Niche as a hub for the railways was absolutely uh, uh, vital as part of this um, uh, uh, network of sabotage. And there's a group called Gordon that was operating out of Niche, which is believed to be the most successful uh, um, sabotage group of the whole of Europe, uh, including France and Belgium and all the rest of it, of the war. Because basically they disabled so much German rolling stock that more had to be brought in for Germany and half of that was also disabled. And I deliberately use the phrase disabled as opposed to destroyed because it minimised the prices. And many of the trains were disabled by the time they got across the border to Greece so nobody could work out who themselves carried out those actions themselves. And therefore, that was the crux of it. It was about defending the people, but it was also about fighting against the occupation themselves. Eventually, in December of 1942, Britain decided to send another officer by the name of William Bailey. Bailey, again, had been a mining engineer uh, in Serbia prior to the war. Prior to um, arriving in Serbia, he'd been in Canada recruiting uh, um, emigre Croats. Most of them were communists into the special operations executive in order to uh, carry out service in Yugoslavia. So as soon as he then arrives uh, with Mikhailovich uh, in Serbia, Mikhailovich knows what he's been doing, recruiting communist Croats into SOE, and the two simply didn't get on uh, right from the beginning. Because of course, as far as Bailey is concerned, he was there to try and get Mikhailovich to do more against the Germans. But of course, what Mikhailovich wasn't keen to do was risk needless lives amongst the Serbs in, in that respect. But nevertheless, operations continued. And under Bailey's uh, 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 command, more and more British officers were sent in in order to basically have British officers with all of Mikhailovich's commanders in order to basically organise that resistance. And again, the stories of these boards tell their own story, particularly in terms of uh, the types of clothes that they wore. Jasper Rutham uh, wrote a fantastic book about his time in Homolje in eastern Serbia called uh, Misfire. He wrote it in 1946. And he talks about how normal British uniform was it was completely the wrong thing to wear when it came to operations in Yugoslavia. 
and therefore many of the officers very much looked like scarecrows in many respects, with all sorts of attire, riding breeches as, as opposed to battle vest trousers, you know, berries, you know, the, rather than wearing what a traditional British uniform would be, that would be uncomfortable and basically not obviously suitable for operations there. And at the same time, as we see Hudson here, quite often they wore civilian clothing in terms of Narada and Moshnia to basically blend in uh, amongst the locals themselves. And that's how they'd get around what was going on in Yugoslavia themselves. Um, as I said, more and more uh, officers basically landed. Um, here there's a map, it's quite small, but when you see themselves, that gives you an idea of the area that these officers covered. What's really interesting, of course, is that the British at this stage were operating mainly in Serbia, mainly in eastern Bosnia, but they didn't go as far as western Bosnia or northern Dalmatia, Lika, Slavonia. That was still basically an area that they didn't go to, and that's very much where Tito and his partisans were operating, as well as the likes of uh, the Dinarska Divizia and, and the like in that respect. So the British did have very little knowledge about what was going in those areas, and therefore when eventually news started to filter out what was going on from those areas, mainly coming from partisan sources, as opposed to British officers themselves. The next group of photographs again show uh, British officers uh, amongst Mikhailovich's forces. Um, after the, um, the capitulation of Italy and being knocked out of the war, the Germans then obviously uh, occupied those areas previously under um, the Italian occupation. And there, there was then you know, a genuine feeling on the ground that the British would land or the Allies would land or open up a second front in the Adriatic. The problem was the Americans were completely against this. The Americans really want to focus all their attention on an, an invasion in the West, in Normandy, because what they didn't want was a clash with the Russians or the Soviets coming in from the East. And therefore, the American view was, no, we can't complicate things on the ground. If we land in the Balkans, which is difficult terrain to fight over, we'd be too close to the Soviet flanks. And therefore, it was ultimately the Americans' decision not to land in the Balkans that really you know, changed the course of history for Yugoslavia in that respect. Churchill was desperate to land in the Balkans. He was desperate to land in southern France. He wanted to basically land in, in, in as many places <coughs> as possible in order to draw German resources away from their fight against the United Kingdom. But it was really the Americans who were very much against it. But basically, in the summer of 1943, uh, and particularly in September and October, there was a feeling that the invasion would come. And therefore, efforts were made to basically sever the railway line link from Belgrade to Sarajevo, which then would allow the Germans to basically send more and more supplies towards the Adriatic. And therefore, um, at this stage, a whole series of operations took place along the Drina Valley, as, as we know it, where a number of towns were captured by Mikhailovich's forces from, uh, from Zvornik down to Visegrad. And again, you'll see some pictures here, which many of you probably haven't seen previously, where all the bridges, for example, uh, along the narrow gate railway that goes through uh, Mokra Gora were destroyed by uh, Mikhailovich's Chetniks under the uh, supervision of a British officer by the name of Archibald Jack. And there he is, there he is, Opankarom. So all the bridges were destroyed. And then, as you can see in, in a picture over here, Visegrad as a town was then captured. Uh, and there you have uh, an image of uh, Zakhary Ostojic, as well as members of the Special Operations Executive and the OSS who witnessed the operation. And they then, from here, then went on to Sarajevo in order to try and uh, capture Sarajevo. But as soon as they got to Rogatica, that's where a clash then occurred between the partisans and the Chetniks, and the operation therefore failed. The Chetniks then had to withdraw, had to withdraw back towards uh, Visegrad, back towards Serbia, and of course, the BBC proclaimed these operations have been carried out by the partisans as opposed to the Chetniks themselves. And I'll talk about why that was in a few moments' time. But of course, it was this incident, particularly around Sarajevo, that caused a problem for the British. And there's a story again in, in, in one of the archives where a partisan who had been captured been brought into the Chetnik camp and was surprised to see British officers with the Chetniks. Because in his camp, there were also British officers. Therefore, we were supporting both sides in effectively a civil war and against the occupation. And of course, from a British perspective, you can't support both sides in a civil war. You have to take a, 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 a side in that respect. And of course, this was really in the beginning of the change in British policy. Already in Cairo, Cairo was the seat and headquarters of Special Operations Executive. You know, there were already mutterings about that we need to also support the communists as well as the royalists. It's wrong that we only support one side against the occupation and not the other. 
and therefore particularly members of the left-wing fraternity, dare I say, uh, in, in SOE were advocating a change in policy, which was previously just simply to support Mikhailovich, because he was, as Minister of, of the Army, obviously loyal to the government in exile in London. And it was basically on, re on the return trip in January of 1943 from uh, meetings in Turkey that Churchill then stopped off in Cairo to meet his old friend, William Deakin. William Deakin was a Cambridge historian <coughs> who helped Churchill to write his uh, account of the Duke of, Duke of Marlborough, who was John Churchill, hence the family name and all the rest of it. And basically, a report was then presented to Churchill by Deakin and another officer by the name of Basil Davidson, which was drafted by another officer by the name of James Klugman, to basically say that we should be supporting the partisans as well as the Chetniks in that regard. And of course, this was in many respects news for Churchill, because he, up until this point, as far as he was concerned, you know, only really knew about uh, Mikhailovich. There's a view, particularly amongst the Serbs, if I, if I could be so bold to say that, people think that every morning Churchill would wake up and think about what's going on in the Balkans, though he, he didn't. You know, he was very much served information. And when it comes to James Klugman, there's a picture of him there, you know, he was, um, uh, uh, again, a, uh, an Oxford graduate, no, Cambridge graduate, uh, potentially known as the sixth man in, in terms of uh, the communist clique. He was president of the Cambridge uh, uh, Communist Party of, of, within the Students' Union, left um, university, went to work for the Comintern uh, in France in, in the, from 1935, met with Tito and Lola Ribar in Paris, found himself working on the Yugoslav desk as a special operations executive in Cairo and was very much the intelligence officer of the whole organization. And you can see how his journey was probably orchestrated because of his desire to support communism, very much Tito in that regard. And therefore, when you read Basil Davidson's book, Special Operations uh, Europe, it's very, very clear how much influence he held uh, in SME in, in the Balkan desk and how his reports and his um, work basically contributed significantly to Britain changing side in support of, of Tito. Davidson himself says it's, it's ludicrous to say that um, Klugman was responsible for change in policy, absolutely true, but the point is he was the architect in many respects because, of course, decisions are made on information and he made sure the information that got to Churchill was what he wanted to be seen. After the war, uh, he, he, was in, uh, he was in a meeting uh, with another uh, British communist. Uh, he didn't know at that time that he was um, being recorded or you know, bugged by MI5, or Secret Intelligence Services, very much in the UK, where he then described how he planned over the period of times a whole series of activities designed, first of all, to get Britain aware of Tito, then to get Britain to support Tito, then to change the information coming out of Yugoslavia to support Tito, and then ultimately then to drop Mikhailovich. So that was Klugman's plan. At the same time, the British used uh, intercept uh, signals intelligence from, from the Germans themselves, Enigma, uh, which was, was codenamed Ultra Intelligence. Uh, why Ultra? Because we have secret information, we have top secret information, and the stuff that was coming out of Enigma, which was the, uh, you know, uh, cryptographic information was therefore ultra secret and therefore that's where the phrase ultra comes from and of course at the same time all these British officers were operating uh, in, in Serbia in 1943 the Germans then mounted two significant operations uh, as part of a number of operations in the, the winter and the summer of 1943 that's Operation Vice in, which was launched in January of 1943 and Operation Schwarz that was launched in, in May of 1943. So from a, what was going on the ground, very much the Germans were after the destruction of the partisans. First of all, Operation Vice, or, or, what, or Case White it was known, was destruction of the new Communist Republic that was in Bihać, the destruction of the partisans towards Nerita Valley, but phase one, phase two. And phase three of Vice was the then destruction of the well, Mikhailovich's Chetniks in Herzegovina. Now, quite often people don't talk about that because that's not part of, dare I say, communist history. But the third phase of Weiss was always the destruction of the Chetniks. The problem was because in March of 1943, the partisans were literally on their, uh, on their knees in many respects. Therefore, on the 11th of March 1943, in a place called Prozor in Bosnia, uh, three individuals from the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, from the partisans, uh, Korsa Popovic, who was the commander of the, the proletariat division, 
um, Milovan Gilias, who was effectively Tito's number two, and Vladimir Velevit uh, met with the Germans in Prozor. Then from Prozor they went to Gornjevkuf, from Gornjevkuf they went to Sarajevo, and from Sarajevo with the Germans they went to Zagreb, and we then have then the famous March negotiations, which basically effectively brought a truce between the Germans and the partisans that allowed the partisans, therefore, to defeat the Chetniks on the, on the Red River. And at the end of those uh, talks, they basically left a signed document to say that they see the Chetniks as their main enemy, that they don't only fight the Germans in self-defense, and that in the event of a British landing on the Adriatic, they would resist the British landings themselves. And of course, these negotiations were kept secret for many, many years until an American diplomat by the name of Walter Roberts published uh, what, it, it, from having spoken to Velebit and Gilias and all the rest of it, published what went on. Uh, and lo and behold, it's, it's for this reason that the Yugoslavs then made these two epic films, the Battle of Nereta and Battle of Sotietska, in order to sort of cement again Tito's version of the history. So there's lots of deception information going on, charges collaboration on all sides. And the point is that all sides not collaborated, but made accommodations with the enemy when it suited their purpose. That is resistance and guerrilla warfare. The problem is, in order to hide your own accommodation, you then blame the other side. And of course, it was right in the middle of the fifth offensive at Sutsetska that the next British mission arrives in Yugoslavia uh, under the guise of uh, William Deacon himself, uh, Churchill's friend and historian. And he then arrives literally bang in the middle of that fifth offensive. One of the officers with him, uh, a, a, a Captain Stewart, is killed in an air attack, which also wounds Tito and kills Tito's dog. And, and Deacon and Tito then form a really close relationship together. And therefore, this is when now more and more reports, because of the epic struggles by the partisans against the Germans to try and break out of, of the stranglehold in Montenegro, then start to reach London. And lo and behold, Tito now is obviously receiving more and more prominence in, 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 in London as far as the British are effectively concerned. Meanwhile, you know, Mikhail is still doing his best as he possibly can in Serbia, but the problem for the British is how do, how do we supply the resistance in Yugoslavia? Because lo and behold, the distance from the UK to Yugoslavia is too great for aircraft. Uh, Italy is still very much in the war in the early stages of 1943, therefore the only way to supply the resistance is by air from North Africa. And bizarrely, only four aircraft were available for that task. And there's another lovely quote in Jasper Rutan's book, uh, Misfire, where one of the Serbian officers said to him, are you trying to tell me Britain, a great empire, could only spare four aircraft? But it was true. And it was all about the, um, the issues between the Royal Air Force, who were really focused about taking the fight to, to the industrial heartland of Germany and, and not wanting to waste aircraft, as far as they were concerned, on a sideshow in the Balkans. And that was really the issue. But the turning point in the war really was the, 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 the you know, Italy being knocked out of the war, the landings at Sicily, not on the Balkans, but in Italy, which basically then allowed Britain and the Americans to use the captured airfields in Italy to supply the resistance. But by this stage, we were now supplying both sides. And that was the problem in the Civil War. But the problem was that the, the, the amount of material being sent to Mikhailovich was minuscule compared to the amount of material being sent to Tito. Because, of course, all the material had been packed and organised by SOE. SOE, which had been infiltrated, as we know, by communists. And therefore, in one night, more supplies were dropped to Tito's forces than Mikhailovich forces throughout the whole of the war in that respect. And the tables then began to turn. Worse was still to come when the Italians did capitulate, and uh, Bailey and Mikhailovich then took the surrender of the Italians in Montenegro, under Bailey's direction, uh, the Italians weren't disarmed because the British desire was for them to, to you know, stay armed and therefore join uh, the, the Allies. Shortly afterwards, the partisans drove the Chetniks out of, uh, of Montenegro and lo and behold, then promptly disarmed uh, the, the Italians and then suddenly inherited significant amount of weapons that really on the ground changed uh, the ability of the partisans to really take the fight uh, to, uh, to uh, the Chetniks in that respect. So lo and behold, two factors. Italy was now uh, in a position to be able to supply Yugoslavia and on the ground materially, Tito's partisans were in a much stronger position in that regard. 
You can see here another picture of uh, British officers, um, basically, who were attending the, um, the second Avnoi in Yaita on the 29th of November of 1943. And of course, it was in this meeting that the British suddenly realized that, lo and behold, what, the, what Tito was trying to achieve in terms of his aims for Yugoslavia in that respect. So at the end of the day, we knew as early as November 1943 about Tito's desire to take over control of Yugoslavia properly at the end of the war. The problem for the partisans still was that they were very, very mobile. And you can see here a picture of a British team operating with partisans and how uh, terrible they look in terms of the uniforms, purely because unlike Mikhailovich's Chetniks, who were very much localised, living in villages, basically on the 6th of May every year, beginning the fight against the occupation until November, the partisans were constantly on the move. But very, very quickly, thanks to British supplies, you know, more and more partisan elements were then being supplied, particularly with weapons and also uniforms, and they then began to resemble a genuine army in that respect, and were taking then more and more territory uh, as they went along. Uh, as for Mikhailovich's forces, you know, they were really struggling uh, at this stage with lack of uh, ammunition, lack of weapons to be able to, uh, to, uh, able to achieve anything. And really, then, it was around December of 1943 that Churchill made his decision to basically drop Mikhailovich. Because as far as he was concerned, from the information that he was receiving, uh, in terms of all the information, uh, it was Mikhailovich who wasn't fighting, Tito was fighting, and therefore, in a civil war, he could only support one side, and therefore Mikhailovich. The problem was that the Yugoslav government, and particularly the king, was against dropping Mikhailovich. And therefore, it took Churchill, really, through pressure to remove two prime ministers, uh, before, lo and behold, um, you know, in, in June 1943, Shubetic was therefore created prime minister. That eventually the conditions were set then to drop behind the But Churchill's view at all stages of the war was for the king to remain king and for basically the king to return to Yugoslavia and therefore for the people themselves to elect a government of their choice. Clearly, Tito had different ideas. Eventually, um, on the 10th of December 1943, an order went out to all the British officers operating in Kailovich to cease operations. And therefore, if they can, on the 30th of December, cross over to the partisan side. Only two groups of British officers carried out that order. All the rest remained in Kailovich forces. As far as they were concerned, they couldn't bear the thought of crossing over now and basically supporting the enemy of the people they were been supporting for the last 18 months in that regard. One of those groups was captured uh, but by the Germans. Uh, the other group under the commander, Captain Robert Wade, made it across. He therefore was one of the few who basically fought on both sides. Um, Churchill then, <clears throat> effectively through the Foreign Office, made a decision in terms of let's put Mikhailovich under the test. Let's therefore get him to destroy, agree to destroy two bridges, one on the Morava River, one on the Ibar River, in order to show that he is willing to take the fight to the enemy. But of course, the decision had been given by SOE Cairo on the 10th of December to cease all operations. Mikhailovich didn't know this was a test, and therefore those bridges weren't destroyed. But the plans, uh, in fact, one of the slides here somewhere, were all made by Archie Jack uh, up here. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the bridge warning. Anyway, one, the pictures of the plans are physically here, and therefore Mikhailovich had every intention to destroy those bridges. He demanded you know, more supplies in order to destroy them. The view from SOE Khan was that he had enough supplies to camp with, he actually didn't. And then, of course, when the order came in not to carry that operation, lo and behold, Mikhailovich was therefore dropped as the army commander. And the decision was then made to evacuate the British military mission in Mikhailovich. And of course, like I said, they were ordered initially to try and cross over to the partisans, and they refused. Therefore, on the 6th of uh, January of 1944, uh, Colonel Bailey, with a small group of about 30 with uh, Czech guides, basically made their way out of Yugoslavia on foot through uh, Serbia, through Bosnia, through Montenegro, and then basically by boat across to Italy. And that was deemed to be too dangerous because down that part of, uh, of Bosnia and Montenegro, not only were the Chetniks fighting the partisans, but the Czechs were fighting the Germans, as were the partisans, were fighting each other. And therefore, it was decided to evacuate them by air. And therefore, an uh, airship was built in a place called Pranjani, near Čačak. Uh, many of you might have heard of the Halyard operation that was launched by the Americans in August of 1944. 
The reason why the Belfast launched that operation was because Mihailovich Chetniks and the British built this airstrip in Pranyandi and successfully evacuated over 100 British officers as well as downed American and uh, British airmen. Uh, Polish prisoners of war had been used as forced labour, uh, including some German prisoners of war, back to Italy. And of course, the Americans realising that many of their airmen who had been using air bases from Italy to destroy the Romanian oil fields were being shot down over Serbia, being saved by bolt resistance organisations, and could therefore be evacuated. Over 500 were saved uh, from the side of Mikhailovich, but a total of 2,400 were saved in Yugoslavia. So more were saved on the side of the partisans than there were on the side of Mikhailovich's forces. But you would expect that, given that we were now supporting the partisans. And of course, in addition to dropping supplies from, from the air, we're also now landing aircraft on improvised uh, strips. And that's where these American British airmen would be loaded onto the aircraft and sent back to, to Italy. The fact that over 500 had been saved from Serbia from an organisation that allegedly had been captured collaborating with the enemy, therefore came as a bit of a surprise, as you can well imagine, which is why that story was kept quiet for, for decades. Of course, it goes against the received wisdom in that respect. So from that moment on, on the 29th of May through to the 31st of May, there were no more British officers uh, operating in Kyla, which is Chetniks, all were now operating with Tito's partisans. In addition to the airmen that were being evacuated, the British also evacuated some 19,000 wounded partisans by air and by boat. And Vladimir Dedia, in, in his memoirs after the war, says it was the evacuation of the wounded that was Britain's greatest support that we gave to the partisans because that enabled them to basically move without restriction of carrying their wounded. And that was important. Also, when the Germans occupied particularly Dalmatia, um, the fear of reprisals against the Serbian population meant that over 30,000 uh, children uh, and, uh, and women were evacuated from uh, Dalmatia, from Lika, uh, to Egypt, to the El Shat refugee camp. Uh, and there's all sorts of things going on there. I think some 650 children were born. Uh, in El Shaq, there are all sorts of marriages. But again, these people were then accommodated, intended accommodation in El Shaq, uh, and remained there for about 18 months before returning back to Yugoslav in that respect. And again, you can see some pictures there in that regard. Um, at the same time as the British uh, had evacuated from Serbia, uh, the Germans mounted another offence against Tito's partisans, against Durvar, uh, Operations Night Move. Tito was almost captured. Uh, the British and American missions with him were captured in, so, in some cases, and he then had to leave Yugoslavia, went to Italy, and then occupied the island of Vis that had been captured by British commandos, uh, number two commando, and therefore the island of Vis became a significant and important staging ground for operations against the Adriatic. And it was at this stage also that we'd created some small Balkan air groups, designed in order, first of all, to supply the combat forces on the ground, but also then we then formed the first partisan squadrons of what then became the Yugoslav Air Force as well. We also trained uh, the partisan paratroopers, and one of the reasons why the Serbian paratroopers, the 63rd Paratroop Brigade, wear the maroon berry, because it's that same berry that British paratroopers wear in the UK as well. Of course, they took on our uniforms, and if you look at the Spitfire here, all that is is an RAF wrangle, an RAF symbol with a red star painted on it. And large numbers of operations were launched by the air and also by sea by British and partisan commandos in this respect. But it wasn't until August of 1944 that the partisans then were able to break into Serbia. And when you read Dunas's mem memoirs, Serbia was the key. Who controlled Serbia controlled Yugoslavia, and therefore it's always going to be a bad fight for Serbia in that respect. The first British officer with the partisans was this individual here by the name of John Henniker Major, uh, from my regiment in fact, and here you see on Matt Radan Fitzroy McLean. And Fitzroy McLean was sent in by Churchill to find out in September of 1943 who was killing the most Germans, and therefore it was his report that was given to the Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden in November 1943, just before the Tehran Conference, known as the Blockbuster Report, that really uh, dictated uh, the switch of policy from, uh, from uh, Mikhailovich to Tito. Interestingly, he only wrote the report after 17 days on the ground. He never visited Serbia, and yet therefore used purely partisan information uh, in order to compile that report. In a documentary 
again made in the 1990s called uh, Tito Churchill's Man, and there's a sequel called Tito, uh, Tito His Own Man. Fitzroy MacLean is challenged uh, about this, and he said, well, look, this is the truth. You know, and I had a very capable officer by the name of uh, uh, Colonel Street, uh, Street, who was also from Special Air Service, as McLean was, who went through their uh, information very carefully. And the point is, their information, it wasn't British information. And this was again another difference between the British officers operating with partisans and those with Mikhailovich's Chetniks. Those with Mikhailovich were not in the headquarters, let's say, with Mikhailovich's officers. They were always somewhere else, able to travel and see what was going on the ground, unfettered access to everybody. Those with uh, Tito's forces were very much contained in Tito's headquarters. They weren't allowed to go and visit uh, on their own any of the units, always under uh, guard by, by the commissars and everything else, and all their reports were therefore compiled mainly from partisan information itself. And in fact, Vladimir um, um, Malevich, uh, in one of his accounts, says he was quite surprised how gullible the British officers were in terms of accepting all the partisan information. He later became the uh, liaison officer uh, in, in Bari with the British and was very much the architect of, the, of where the Royal Air Force, the Balkan Air Force and the American 15th Air Force were to bomb. And therefore the bombings that took place in places like Belgrade or Banja Luka or Podgorica or uh, elsewhere were very much based on target lists that the partisans had generated for the Allies to destroy. And of course, as far as uh, officers like Michael Leese, who wrote the book Rape of Serbia, is concerned, this was all about terrorizing the Serbian people. It was all about showing the Serbs who now held the power, and therefore the partisans were able to bomb them. But it was also an attempt to discredit the Allies in the face of the people. And interestingly, the Russians, the Soviets rather, never bombed Yugoslavia. It was just basically the Allies, and of course, to this day, we know how the bombing of Belgrade is part of uh, you know, you know, you know, the negative perspective on the British in that respect. Like I said earlier, uh, as far as Churchill was concerned, he always wanted the king to return because he owed the king that debt of, uh, uh, of, of gratitude for what happened in March 1941. And also, Churchill was a monarchist. And of course, it was when he met Tito in Italy in, in August of 1944, Tito gave Churchill assurances that, end of the day, he would impose communism on Yugoslavia and it would be the will of the people that ultimately uh, came to fruition. And of course, at the end of the war, all the promises that uh, Tito gave Churchill came to nothing. And in the speech that Churchill gave uh, in, in Belgium shortly after the war, he said, I thought I could trust Tito and I now realise I made the greatest mistake of the war. And John Henneker Major, who I pointed out earlier, uh, he, after the war, after the Trieste crisis of 1945, uh, went to see John Colville, who had been uh, Churchill's private secretary throughout the war. He was now head of the Foreign Office's Balkan desk, and he was a relation of his as well. He was kept waiting in John Colville's office for half an hour as Colville was writing a memo. And then, lo and behold, after half an hour, Cole will raise his head, and he then said, pity we didn't support Mikhailovich. And therefore, at the end of the war, there were serious questions being asked. How could we have got it so wrong in Yugoslavia in that respect? And Churchill, in fact, then started asking Secret um, Intelligence Services, was Tito really the man we thought he was? Because, of course, as far as um, you know, Churchill was concerned, we'd been hoodwinked. And there's a, a historian by the name of Peter Batty who wrote another fantastic book, book called Hoodwink and Churchill, uh, which is again well worth reading that respect. Ultimately, uh, the war was over uh, following the invasion of, of Yugoslavia by the Red Army. It was very much the Red Army that liberated Serbia, liberated Belgrade, and the partisan in support in that regard. But of course, as soon as uh, Tito was on this, he then went to Moscow in order to agree with Stalin. Yugoslavia was to be liberated, and a key aspect of that agreement was that the Russians wouldn't stay, and they then continued out of Serbia into Hungary towards Vienna, and that then left partisans to liberate the rest of Yugoslavia. But the problem was, of course, is that fighting the Germans in open conflict was very, very different to guerrilla warfare. And therefore, a key aspect of British partisan cooperation was in September of 1944, which was known as Operation Rapid. That was a, a, a an operation designed to prevent the Germans withdrawing from Greece to Yugoslavia. And of course, it was exactly at this time that the partisans were able to break into Serbia 
course, one of the concerns Churchill had when he went to Tito to say, I'm concerned that the weapons that we are sending to fight the Germans are not being used against the Germans or against your own countrymen. The Germans are pretty well able to evacuate through Yugoslavia pretty well untouched in many respects, according to their own plans. And we know, particularly on the, on the Srem front uh, in, in, in northern Yugoslavia, it's now sort of war between Serbia and Croatia, how many thousands of Yugoslavs and the youth of Serbia were sacrificed because the Germans were very much holding that line to allow them to force to withdraw back towards Austria, and then when they were ready, they then pulled back that allowed the partisans, therefore, to capture the Srem from the respect. Um, critically, um, as, as I mentioned, Šubašić then became Prime Minister in the summer of 1943. Whilst on this, he then came to an agreement to bring together the de jure, the legal and de facto governments of Yugoslavia under Tito. He remained as Prime Minister, uh, then became the, the Foreign uh, Secretary effectively to Tito, uh, and, and then effectively was, was, was taken out of power at the end of the Second World War in that respect. But very much the British were very much, you know, as far as we're concerned now, losing influence with, with Tito. As far as Churchill's concerned, you know, he'd been betrayed. And therefore, by April 1943, we effectively stopped supporting uh, the partisans or the National uh, Liberation Army of Yugoslavia. And things almost came to a head in Trieste in May of 1945 with the Trieste crisis. Um, and then, lo and behold, that's effectively how the war ended. Interestingly, uh, even as uh, late as uh, the 27th of March of 1945, we see Tito there in Belgrade. British flags were still very much prominent uh, in, 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 in Belgrade on, on, on the parade that went through Belgrade itself. That's Tito uh, giving his speech from the, what's now the, the, uh, the National Museum. You see a British flag behind him. But lo and behold, after uh, the end of the war, we effectively lost all influence. And when you read this on the claims, uh, what Eastern approaches, you know, considering the amount of weaponry and uniforms that we sent the partisans when he left Belgrade after reopening the British Embassy, the transformation of the partisan army to the Yugoslav army was complete and it effectively resembled the Russian army or the Soviet army in, in that respect. So there was lots of questions being asked of how this could have happened. Um, the last thing I'll really say is that you know, these are images of the British Embassy being uh, reopened. Uh, when General Alexander also visited in, in February of 1945. And it's interesting, though, that the actual decor in, in the embassy is exactly the same. Um, like I said, many of these pictures ha ha haven't previously been seen before I, I, I launched this exhibition. Uh, and I found this particular picture here, sorry, in the Imperial War Museum. And to me, it meant nothing. I didn't recognize any of the individuals themselves. As far as I was concerned, there were three uh, Serbian uh, Czechs in that respect. And then, before I actually published the exhibition, exhibition on the British military auction site, these medals came up for sale in Dix Noonan auctioneers. Lo and behold, that picture with it. And so, what you have here, in fact, are two certain Czechs and the British uh, non commissioned officer, and they're his medals from Yugoslavia itself. So, history is something that uh, is a living thing, it's not simply uh, you know, uh, confined to the past. I think ultimately we can all learn a great deal from history, particularly when it's a battle for the narrative, and we can see that today in terms of what's going around the world in that, in that respect. But also, you know, it is true that history is written by the victors, but ultimately the truth comes out. And, um, you, know, you know, what went on in Yugoslavia to this day divides society purely because some people genuinely can't believe that what they believe to be, you know, false information or, you know, dare I say, uh, you know, side is wrong, how can they now be right when that's how they were portrayed in terms of the history books themselves? And the point is, is that actually what was happening in Yugoslavia was a war of liberation against the occupation and the civil war at the same time. And ultimately, you know, the first casualty in any war is the truth. And I hope through this exhibition, you can see a slightly different version of what, what went on through images, because ultimately images speak the truth. Uh, they can be doctored now, but ultimately these images that come from the archives, many had previously not been published, but probably not published for a reason, because it goes against the received wisdom of that time now.